Good morning on this final Sunday of the decade, December 29th, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. Georgia's newest U.S. Senator will be sworn in on January 6th. A state senator wants more Georgia students admitted early to some of the state's top public universities. And we count down our top political stories of the year and the decade. And it's a tough day as we're saying so long to one of our regulars here on the Georgia Gang. Darren, Phil, Janelle and Alexis are all here. The debate and discussion begin right now. Well, Kelly Leffler is poised to take her oath of office on January 6th as Georgia's new U.S. Senator. Her first major vote could be on whether to remove President Donald Trump from office. She's already said that she'll be voting no. Phil, just want to know, have you heard much in terms of her staff? I mean, she's got to be really busy right now. That's right. In fact, she's actually got two offices to try to do. She's got uh, the Washington, D.C. office, of course. And uh, I understand that she's keeping a lot of uh, Senator Johnny Isaacson's staff right now, which would be a good move. Of course, he's retiring December 31st and we'll miss him. And then, of course, she also has to do her campaign staff. And because, mm -hmm. as we know, yes. uh, she's got to run in the November 2020, what we call the jungle primary, uh, along with Georgia's other U.S. Senator. Theron, how much scrutiny do you think she will be under the first few weeks? Well, if you look at what the Democratic Party of Georgia is doing already, they're sending out, if not daily, sort of every other day emails, just kind of, you know, labeling her as sort of a far-right candidate. But I got to give the senator a little bit of credit here. She's been very disciplined. A lot of us have been calling for her to do more public appearances. And since two weeks ago, she has been a little bit more public. So I think that um, the first vote is going to be important. But where she stands on the impeachment and the trial, I think we already know she said no. But it's how her team amplifies it in the state. But she better get ready because I'm telling you, the Democratic Party is definitely going to continue to make her a target and try to push her farther and to the middle. Theron, she, or, or Janelle, she's, mm -hmm. you know, working while she's also going to have to be campaigning. How Absolutely. difficult would that be to, for that line? Um, I don't think it's going to be too difficult for her, being that she is um, a manager at heart. That's just what she does. And I think she'll manage this pro appropriately. I also think that it's exciting to see that this is a historic moment. Let's not forget that this is a historic election for her and um, her being picked as a female. So um, I look forward to seeing what comes out of it. Alexis. Yeah, the thing that I'm concerned about is her announcing her position about the impeachment before the trial even starts, when the senators are supposed to be sworn to be impartial and listen to all the evidence and have it as a trial. She's already announced her verdict. You mean like the eight or nine Democrats have already announced <laughs> they want to impeach him? She's not the only one. <laughs> well, the, the impeachment part thinking. is the political part. The trial is the actual legal part. Well, as we get ready for the 2020 legislative session here in Georgia, we're hearing more about new bills that could be up for debate. One of them may be music to the ears of many parents of high school students. Senator Brandon Beach says too many Georgia students are being denied early admission to some of the top public universities in the state, and he wants more Georgia students accepted so we're not sending some of our top students out of state to possibly never come back. Theron, mm -hmm. your take on this. I, I understand absolutely where he's coming from. I'm the mother of a 12 year old already looking ahead, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, should the legislature be involved in college admissions? Well, you got to give Senator Beach a lot of credit. I mean, mm -hmm. he's working during the off session months. I mean, this is a wonderful idea that I think is going to get a lot of bipartisan uh, support. I mean, I hear from a lot of my friends and who are parents that want their children to stay in state but also I think that this puts the university presidents on notice I think Phil was saying before we started taping there is going to be four universities mm -hmm. that are going to be targeted so I think these presidents of these institutions need to get with Senator Beach very soon to try to craft a bill that fits everyone. Janelle Absolutely. real quickly weigh in on this since you're one of the younger panelists. Yeah I think it's great I think it's great I mean into in state tuition it's always a positive um, and uh, I do think that if you live here you should have you know first dibs at the colleges that, that serve you. All right we're moving on because it is a packed show and coming up we count down some of the top political stories of the year and the decade. Let's get right to our list of some of the top political stories of 2019. No doubt the inauguration of Governor Brian Kemp after a brutal election. Many waited in anticipation just to see how he would govern. Alexis, we'll go with you. Your okay. top political stories. Okay, I'll go with this one because it was a big uh, election that was very, very close. And I think he's, it's, he's governed better than I thought he would because the election was so close. He's done some things that especially his appointments have been very diverse with uh, different kinds of people 
that you didn't expect him to appoint. And I think the uh, thing that, that he did with the U.S. Senate was interesting, although at first I thought it was all for show, but then it ended up really great with a very unusual pick for the U.S. Senate to replace Isaacson. So I think he's done some interesting things, but it's because it was so close, because the state is 50-50 now. So he's one of your winners of 2019? <laughs> I'll make him a winner. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Janelle. Yeah, so Governor Kemp is definitely a winner of 2019 as well for me. Um, but I have to mention the heartbeat bill. I thought that was a big story. Um, and that is also in conjunction with um, Governor Kemp because that was something that he pushed as soon as he got into office. And I thought that was amazing. Um, to the base. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, I mean, you know what? Someone who's pro-life, the heartbeat bill is exactly what we need. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's it was time. So. Well, um, so Phil, I'll push you a little bit. Mm -hmm. What's yours? Because, you know, the rise of Stacey Abrams to the national political scene really made headlines this year too. That's right. She was defeated and now she wants to be vice president or try to be meaningful on the national stage. I don't think it's going to work. She may run again against Kemp in 2022. I agree that uh, Brian Kemp's inauguration was the big one. You know, the new voting machines I thought was a big story for this year and uh, we're testing them out right now and we'll keep we our fingers crossed and we hope they work right. and of course a uh, new Senator Kelly Leffler. Absolutely. I know you want to get to the investigation of corruption at Atlanta City Hall. Yes. It, no, that's on your list because you emailed me. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. I believe there was over a dozen convictions and indictments this past year. The federal investigation continues over bid rigging and, and corruption and malfeasance uh, in City Hall. And so uh, it'll extend on into the new year. So happy new year to Kasim Reed and <laughs> Keisha Lance Bottoms. <laughs> Mayor. Keisha Lance Bottoms and former mayor. <laughs> Go ahead, there. No, uh, my, my definitely highlight of the year was definitely the Super Bowl. Uh, huh? I think that Atlanta was on the world stage. Uh, I think it was handled in a very good way. It was a partnership between the city, the state, and the federal government. And so I think that, you know, a lot of folks were worrying about security and could we handle traffic. A lot of folks use MARTA and different public transportation means. And so I definitely think that the city of Atlanta, uh, particularly working with the city council and the state and the federal government, was a big big win for the um, for the entire state in 2019. Let's also mention that Georgia Insurance Commissioner Jim Beck was indicted on 38 federal counts including mail fraud and money mm -hmm. laundering. His trial I guess will be next year mm -hmm. um, as we head into the new year. A another big announcement that we we can't avoid mentioning of course is Senator Johnny Isaacson making yeah. the surprise announcement that he will retire. Mm -hmm. Big moment in Georgia history for him. Um, as he retires, Theron. Well, the thing that has been just so great is that he's handled it with so much grace mm -hmm. and he's been publicly talking about it. And I got to give the governor a little bit of credit too. I think that while many thought that he took a long time to make the decision. I think he picked the person who he wanted to succeed, Senator Isaacson, but really just how the Republicans and Democrats all came together. And we can't forget that display of friendship uh, that Congressman John Lewis and Senator Isaacson showed on the House floor. So definitely that was a big story this year. And Phil, I mean, Senator Isaacson, that's what he's known for. I mean, he's bipartisan. bipartisan. Yeah. That's right. One I mean, of the he's a, he's remaining a solid, few. He's a solid uh, Republican, and uh, when the Republican conservatives need him, he's always there. As a veteran myself, I have to say that I appreciate what he's done over the years. He's been chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee. There's been a lot of people fired. He's worked with President Trump to finally fire these incompetent people, especially here in Atlanta and DeKalb County. And uh, I would have to say that uh, Kelly Leffler is taking uh, a slot on the Veterans Affairs Committee, which I thought was great that Senator Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader, did that. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, too, I think that she is a great representation to um, succeed um, Senator Isaacson, being that she speaks to a broad base. I know we'd like to pigeonhole her as the, into the one white, white suburban woman space, but she speaks to rural Georgia. She speaks to the business owner. She speaks to the family. I mean, it, it's, I think she's a great example. And Alexis, yeah. I don't want to take away from this moment for mm -hmm. Senator Isaacson. And I was kind of going through some of your pictures that you sent over. I noticed you, you were having lunch with him yeah, today. well, a lot the, of history there. Yeah, the Georgia gang has had lunch mm -hmm. with him on a regular basis through the years, and he also was wonderful during the inauguration of Barack Obama. He gave me tickets to get into the crowd. Oh. You know, I was in the first <laughs> half a million of people instead of <laughs> the second. So it was really, he was really wonderful, very gracious, and very kind. Another big story in the city of Atlanta, Theron, the Atlanta School Board decides not to renew Maria Karstarfin's contract as school superintendent. Yeah, and then we've seen that that's kind of kind of simmered down a little bit. I mean, it dominated this panel discussion for about a month, but um, definitely I think that the school board is collaborating with the parents and the teachers and the faculty and staff 
have to basically turn the page and move to the next chapter. Yeah, I'm excited to see what's next for her. Well, it was still a big mistake, and it's still going to be a black mark because uh, she had high test scores, the graduation rates went up, and uh, yes, she had personality conflicts with some of the board, but uh, they should have given her another chance. Well, I had a great Christmas feel. I'm not going <laughs> to push back. So. All right. There were well, good. about the charter, the charter school. So. All right. We're going to move on because we've got the top political stories of the decade coming up. Our top stories of the decade, the top political stories. I would have to say, my first one, I'm stealing it from Theron, is Snowpocalypse 2014. <laughs> <laughs> Georgia and Metro Atlanta made national headlines when two inches of snow crippled the city and stranded. Oh, there's the video. The wow, we remember oh that goodness. so well. Ooh. Stranded drivers for hours and even days, Ooh. Theron. <laughs> yeah, I remember that day vividly. I was actually at an event where Governor Deal was there, former Mayor Kasim Reed was there, I think, at the time. Uh, Michael Thurman was the superintendent of the Cap County Schools and when we left the Ritz Carlton and we saw these people just evacuating from the buildings downtown it was just small flurries and so um, thankfully I took MARTA home that day <laughs> and um, even the MARTA trains were packed so definitely I think it's one of the most memorable moments in Atlanta in our decade. Oh, Phil. Yeah. Well I, not to be partisan but we had a decade of Republican <laughs> governance and it's been a great <laughs> great run we've had uh, the best uh, jobless uh, a rate in, in recorded Georgia history. We've got uh, a AAA okay, uh, rating, ever. credit rating, which mm -hmm. only a few states enjoy. We've got a giant reserve fund. Our economy has been growing. And so uh, I think people ought to realize that politics does affect everyone's pocketbook. But to that extent, Janelle, we've also seen Gwinnett and Cobb County f mm -hmm. flip this past decade to mm -hmm. a more Democratic base. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think because we had a lot of historic runs, you know, I mean, we can't take away from the fact that when Stacey Abrams ran, it was historic. She would have been the first uh, African-American female governor. Um, I think that that definitely played a major role in the flip, as well as we had President Trump on the ballot, who was something new and different that we needed. Um, so I, I think it was awesome. I think and I, I have to pick President Trump as my um, winner of the decades. <laughs> it's just coming in, infiltrating the Republican Party and showing us where we can do better. And I think that he's done a great job. Some of your top political stories of the decade, Well, Alexis. I would say the re-election of Barack Obama. Uh, nobody expected that because of the hard time that he was given during his time as president. Um, also, I wanted to talk about um, what was the thing I was going to talk about? She always throws me because I, I don't know what I'm going to do when I after gonna, after she made Donald Trump. Uh, after she made Donald Trump the winner, but he's the winner in terms of being impeached. I guess it's only the third president in history to have that happen, so he makes some history there. Well, I'll also <laughs> well, let's just see. If coming back to Georgia, he was impeached. He coming back to well, Georgia, he might not be removed, but he was impeached. Go ahead. He definitely was impeached, Alexis. Thank he you. Was. Coming yes. back to Georgia, uh, yes, because our viewers <laughs> like it when we talk about Georgia. Oh, I know. It was supposed yeah. to be Stacey Abrams was my winner of okay. the decade, but. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly doing what she said, becoming a historic candidate for governor at the Democratic Party, and she just been on and her other activities to fair fight Georgia, et cetera. That's on the list, mm -hmm. so I'll check that one off. I think Governor Nathan Deal's veto of the religious freedom bill was definitely a moment that a lot of us will never forget because I think it could have changed the course of business mm -hmm. in Georgia. I think it could have changed Georgia's reputation, and that was a bold move. It wasn't easy being a Republican governor. Well, let me tell you this. Yeah. I was down at the Capitol with many other people. I know Phil was down there as well. And we talked a lot about it on the show. And so it was that pivotal moment where I think Georgia was at an intersection where we were going to be on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. And I got a compliment from former Governor Deal. I know he watches this show with, with the former First Lady. I mean, he was pressed very, very hard. But I got to also compliment the business community who I think stepped up and basically said, you know what, this is bad for business, this is bad for Georgia. So definitely that was one of the pivotal political moments in our history. Phil, I remember interviewing Governor Deal on this issue. It was very emotional for him, too. Um, he teared up, you know, and he basically said, you know, who am I to judge? It was a difficult decision for him. Well, it was. Fortunately, we have a federal law that does guarantee uh, religious liberties, and um, all it was trying to be done, as we all remember, was to try to give another layer of protection. And you still have Governor Kemp saying, you know, I, I would still be in favor of, of a law that mirrors the federal law. And so um, I don't see it as 
is that pivotal? I, I see other things, especially our economic and job growth, is, is far more pivotal. These, these issues come and go. We're in a cultural war between the right and the left, and uh, so these things are going to continue. Um, Janelle, we do have historic lows in terms of unemployment mm -hmm. here in Georgia. The economy is looking good. Um, you know, how long we can sustain that is the question. Absolutely. Um, yes, the economy is doing extremely well. I mean, I, my husband and I joke about it all the time that it's kind of doing better than what we anticipated. Um, so it's hard to hire people. But um, the fact is everyone is working, everyone is, is doing better, and that is awesome. We have to acknowledge that, especially in the African-American community, I feel like we, we neglect that a lot or a lot of times we kind of push past it because we don't want to highlight what President Trump has done in the, with the economy. However, the African American community is definitely seeing wins and I'm excited about that. Well, the economy is growing, but I don't think the wages are keeping up enough. So the reason people are, are everybody's employed because people are working two jobs just to make ends meet. So I think we need to take a look at that. Well, the wage gap between African Americans and, and, and Caucasians is the, the smallest it's ever been in history. It's, so it's, it's happening. You know, we just have to give it time. But I'm talking about for everybody needs to have a, you know, the federal minimum wage is still seven dollars. You won't give him any credit for a good well, economy. Let's also, None at all. Yes, let's get the prior. Well, let's nothing. get let's get the prior administration credit Absolutely. too. Because Regulations were cut under President Trump. We've had uh, fantastic uh, growth. That's and, great. And, and you don't, that that never happened under Barack Obama. That's not true. Listen, I think that <laughs> while I will give President Trump some credit for the economy, well, thank you. but I want you to also give credit to former President Barack it, it Obama didn't happen. for Stifling, having big government, 70 big plus consecutive months of job growth in this country. So he's, he basically started on third oh, base. That's right. a myth. President you Trump always have to go back to President Trump and former President Obama. <laughs> because of Georgia. Georgia. Well, yeah. I know, but it does know, affect Georgia. Yes, it, it does, does affect Georgia. Georgia. I'm going to say one more political story of the decade before we head out. The first presidential debate in decades is held at Tyler Perry Studios as Democratic candidates took to the stage. And that was big for Georgia, put Georgia on the national mm -hmm. map. So coming up, a major announcement from Alexis Scott here on The Georgia Gang. Stay tuned. Well, it's a major announcement today from our own Alexis Scott, and this is not easy, Alexis. Tell the viewers your decision. Well, I'm retiring, as it were. That means I'm not going to be here anymore on the show. And uh, it was 18 years ago that I first started, and I started as a fill-in, as you've seen some of the mm -hmm. folks who come in when folks are out. And then I became a regular with uh, Martha Zoller, Phil Kent, uh, Jeff Dickerson and Dick Williams as host. So it, I'm very grateful for the opportunity that I've had to share my views. But mostly I came because there's a Chiron that uh, goes on the screen under your name. Yes. And it was helped me promote the Atlanta Daily World, which I had taken over after 22 years at Cox Enterprises and the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. And so it was a wonderful opportunity to market the paper. Well, we wanted to take a look back, uh, not just at your time here on the show, but also your place in Georgia's history. Take a look. Most of the African American voters are women as well, so I think that uh, Kathy Cox really does have a leg up on this. Since 2002, Alexis Scott has brought her perspective as a newspaper journalist, executive and visionary community leader to the Georgia gang. Slowly but surely, the education of, uh, commitment is being eroded. She has been unapologetic in her opinions, oftentimes clashing with conservative panelists over the years. Isn't that a that racial way? grenade that's being thrown? It is not a racial at, at, grenade. It is a racial reality. Are all Republicans uh, for Ferguson shootings? If you do not participate, you do not count. We had an opening on the Georgia gang. We were looking for a panelist who had a sort of a left-wing Democratic point of view. Alexis uh, was just perfect because she's, she is a, an intelligent, thoughtful liberal uh, who who argues without being argumentative. For more than 15 years, Alexis has brought viewers a deeper understanding of Atlanta's rich civil rights history. Alexis is so much a part of the community of Atlanta. Uh, she just offered insights that nobody else could offer. And uh, I think even hard right conservatives or conservatives like me are not offended by her liberal views. They're actually interesting 
because she's not a rabble rouser. Alexis spent 17 years as publisher of the Atlanta Daily World, a newspaper founded by her grandfather in 1928. It became the nation's first successful black-owned daily newspaper in America. Over her 23-year career at Cox Enterprises, Alexis worked her way up from reporter at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution to vice president of community affairs, and then on to the C-suite as director of diversity at Cox. She offers that, that unique perspective uh, about black Atlanta that I don't think uh, white residents of Atlanta or newcomers to Atlanta really fully understand, and, and Alexis is invaluable in that. For decades, Alexis's ties to the community have been evident through her work in the nonprofit world. She is the immediate past chair of the Atlanta Interfaith Broadcasters Network, the first woman to hold that position. She is active as a board member of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival, the Booker T. Washington Legacy Foundation, and the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau, just to name a few. She and her family were inducted into the inaugural Atlanta Press Club Hall of Fame, and she was named one of the top 100 women of influence by the Atlanta Business League for more than 15 years. Whether elected officials agreed with Alexis or not, there has always been a deep respect of her and her family's contribution to Atlanta, to Georgia, and the nation. Former Atlanta Mayor Shirley Franklin said, quote, Alexis Scott has led the way for many journalists in Atlanta and across the country, continuing the Scott family legacy. Whether as a reporter, executive, or commentator, Scott has performed with integrity and skill. As she retires, we celebrate her and her body of work. Thank you, Alexis. What we're all going to miss about Alexis uh, is, is how sweet and pleasant she is, how she can argue what I consider sometimes preposterous political positions in the sweetest, nicest way possible and never gets angry. I think Alexis in some ways is going to be the most difficult to replace. We can find a conservative like me. Uh, we can find a liberal like Theron. But Alexis just has this, this different perspective that I think and this historical position in Atlanta, in greater Atlanta, that I think is gonna be impossible to replace. Plus, she's so darn nice. <laughs> I think Dick wrapped that up so well that we are all replaceable. She is not. Oh, please, please, please. That was so sweet. I didn't realize Dick was going to do that. Thank you very much. I also have a quote from Jeff Dickerson. Um, Theron reached out to him. Grace, charm, humility, and wit. These things you brought to the Georgia gang year after year. Thank you for being a great friend and ally. Very nice, Jeff. But you know, you do offer this different perspective, and that was kind of your point of coming on the show, was a different perspective for viewers. Right, and that's why I really am grateful to Dick for bringing me on, because he wanted viewers to be able to have a different point of view about what was going on, or diverse points of view, not just me, but having different points of view, so that was great. Theron, some funny moments yeah. that you have with Alexis. Well, you two are kind of in the same corner. Yeah, I got you some flowers, so I'll <laughs> yes. get them to pass down to you here. Oh, but so Alexis, I will just tell you, um, when I graduated from Clark Atlanta University, uh, mm. I, you know, watched the Georgia game coming up as a young kid in Athens, and <laughs> and when you joined the show, uh, it really, to me, was needed. Um, you not only just speak to Black Atlanta. Everywhere I go, when people see me in restaurants, people see me uh, on the streets, they always brag about you. And, and I've actually learned a lot from you and how to handle my good friend Phil Kim uh, <laughs> with, with grace and respect. But more importantly, I think some of my most um, memorable moments with you is calling you before I came on the Georgia Gang, and I would um, return your call sometimes and I always wanted to make sure you had all the information you needed because you pride yourself on being a very factual journalist. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to miss you. I've learned so much from you. Mm -hmm. And I definitely think that anytime you want to come back yes. and, and sit in one of these chairs, yes, and um, fill in. You're, welcome. you're more than welcome. <laughs> but just know that you are beloved all across Georgia. And I'm telling you, all the African-American women um, know the contributions that you've made to this society and what you continue to make. And I'm just going to miss you. And don't, don't worry. Um, we will continue to pray together before I come on the show. <laughs> <laughs> 
Dr. <laughs> Janelle and Phil. <laughs> Thank you for all your great work. Thank you, Phil. Janelle, do you want to go next? Um, you know, I know I'm just getting to know you, um, but I will say that I am, my, my love of respect for you is so great and so high. I, mm -hmm. I appreciate you as another African-American woman. You've paved the way. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really means so much to me, despite our political views that put all that to the side. Um, you are an inspiration, and thank you for what you've done. Thank you. Thank you. And Phil. Well, we've had some great debates over the years, Alexis, and there's, there's a little uh, a so champagne. I perfume? Know you thought it was perfume. <laughs> but uh, I have always, uh, we've always thank had a pact that I've always defended you in the white community, and you defended me in the black community. I appreciate that. And, you know, I've degree. always militantly, I've militantly defended your right to be wrong. <laughs> and there was a key moment this year, there was a key moment this year, you know, you once admitted you were a socialist, which of course horrified me and many <laughs> millions of viewers, but anyhow, you this, provoked year, me to admit this that. year you admitted that you were not a socialist, yes. and so thank you. Well, I'm a socialist, <laughs> democratic socialist is what I would consider myself. What does that mean? That means I'm a capitalist with regulation. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think like she's that. she's That's moving to the right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the middle. To the middle. Oh, well, and Alexis, if you want to just wrap up, just your your yeah. thoughts to viewers. Well, mm -hmm. I just want to thank the viewers for watching and uh, inviting me into their homes. I also want to thank my husband for being wonderful, and I'm ready for my next adventure with him. We're making a movie, and he's making lots of movies, but one in particular has to do with my dad and his experiences in World War II. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to thank my sons who sacrificed their time with me over the years. 45 years I've wow. been doing journalism. And so it's been a wonderful run and I thank you all. And well, we thank, thank you, you for all your contributions. We're gonna miss you, I'm gonna miss you. I thank you for really just welcoming me with open arms to the show. Thank you. So thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone for watching. Um, best wishes to Alexis and we will see you again next week. Bye-bye. The opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the panelists appearing in this program.